Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Phil John's VIP. Thank you so much. I am Phil John, your host for tonight. I appreciate you guys stopping by and checking me out. Um, we launched our fourth season uh, last Saturday with uh, a, a lovely lady, Miss Audrey Lawrence, who I had an opportunity and a joy to introduce you all to. Um, and tonight... I have another special guest. All my guests are special. I always say it every every Saturday. But um, I'm looking forward to this young lady coming on board. She is a powerhouse producer in the industry. Her and I have been friends and colleagues for a long time. And it's not too many. Afro Tito, what's up? Thank you. Thank you, mi gente. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let me wave at you real quick. Thank you so much for always showing me love and shouting me out. Um, Okimo T. Moore is her name. She is a super producer. She's produced everything for Netflix and um, not everything for Netflix, but she's produced uh, shows for Netflix and Nickelodeon. She is an actress. She is a powerhouse. And I say that again, a powerhouse of a singer and an incredible talent, all around talent. She is a, uh, a recognizable name in this industry and highly well respected. Um, I call her the Michelle Obama of our circle because she's just that bad when she does what she does. And she does it with ease and grace and class and sophistication and the utmost professionalism. Um, so without further ado, I, I'm, I'm not even going to give you her resume because it's way too extensive. I'm going to come on. I want her to come on and I want her to tell you about all that she is and the black girl magic that she's been sprinkling all over the country since forever. So without further ado, I'm going to present to you Miss Actress, singer, producer, entrepreneur, powerhouse, Okima T. Moore. Ah, here she, she come. Ah, let, let, let me bring her in. 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 Here she comes, here she comes, here she comes, here she comes. Yes, 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 yes. Hello? Oh, Kima T. Moore. Hi. It's so good to see you. Let me adjust my camera. Oh. It is so good to see you. Thank you so much. You're looking youthful and glowing and all that stuff. Well, thank you. It's good to be seen, child, because it'd be rough out here. <laughs> I'm sure. Thank you for joining me for the VIP. It's been a minute. And I wanted to definitely talk to you because I know your schedule is hectic and crazy. So I'm glad that you allowed me just to have this hour with you. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So let's get let's get into it. What have you been up to these days? Because it's so hard. I was thinking earlier today exactly what, how could I describe Okima, because <laughs> there's so much that you do in the industry, um, behind the scenes, in front of the camera, and just, just the God-given talent that you have. I love so you where is the focus now? Um, well, when I first started, um, I think I wanted just to be on, right? Like, I was an actor, I was a singer, I, you know, I started in the acting space as a very small child, not knowing what I was getting into um, on Sesame Street back in 84. You don't have to give the year if you don't want to. It's a child, I have no problem letting you all know I will be fully <laughs> for months. Anyway, it's fine. Right, right. Uh, but I started on Sesame Street just literally as something to do. I had a very young mom and she was, you know, living her best 20, early 20 something life. And I had an, you know, an older grandmother. And so my mother put me in all these different things to kind of keep me busy. Um, after Sesame Street, then it got into, then I uh, got into music. I was in a group for a long time. Um, we used to tour with the Black Expo and we did all the, how can I be down and Jack the Rapper and New Music Seminar and all those things. Um, we were signed to Tamar Braxton's ex-husband, Vincent Herbert, um, in 95. 
um, my saw my junior year in co in high school, mm -hmm. um, and then some things happened. Sylvia Rohn dropped their label. It was him and Barry Hankerson. Sylvia Rohn wound up dropping their label. We got involved in college, and I swore in the dramatic fashion of the Capricorn who's an artist, I'm never gonna perform again. Uh, because you know, I thought that this was it. I thought this is it. I'm gonna be a star. It's and so thankfully over the years, I began to fall in love with work, mm -hmm. not being seen. And that was just coming from a child, you know, I, I say all the time, I grew up in a very, you know, fortunately, fiscally well off family, but like a lot of West Indian families and just families in the eighties and nineties, like your families are working so hard to provide mm -hmm. that sometimes the last thing that's thought of is the affection and the love and you know i went through some traumas as a child and and so i didn't really have a voice and i didn't really have a lot of stuff emotionally that i i should have um and could have and so you know being seen and and being someone else um was a dream because who i was or who i saw myself as or who i didn't see myself as was just hard mm -hmm. And so, you know, fast forward to adult life and really, you know, as I started to find myself in as an adult in the game, um, I knew I wanted to be good as an actor and I had a lot of work to do to get there um, as an adult. And I knew that I wanted to be a better singer. Um, and so I began to work and I began to train and take, because I didn't go to a conservatory. My degree is in business and finance and investments. Um, I worked on Wall Street from, you know, I worked in business banking from 99 to 2015. Um, and most of those years from, oh, I don't know, I want to say from like 07 to 2015 was spent in investment banking and then hedge funds. So I was a Wall Street. The thick of corporate America. Yeah. Where, and this is before DEI was a thing. Right. Or so it was nothing for people to tell me that I lived in the ghetto because I lived in bed -Stuy. It was nothing for people to deal with me. No ghetto no more. Like, I know, right? Now it's Bed Bath & Beyond style. <laughs> but, like, now it's different. But back then, like, it was nothing for people to remind me that I was a little Black girl trying to be in their world. Yeah. And, you know, in 2015, I was like, yeah, this sucks. And I was literally, I would cry every day in the morning getting work mm. and i was like this ain't it and so my sister my little sister jelani was graduating from college and i was at breakfast with my father and my brother tears and my father was like so just quit i was like who gonna pay for my life y'all mm -hmm. like i don't just quit sounds cute but then what and he's like no but this ain't working either clearly so figure it out yeah and so in 2015, I left my, for those that saw the movie Inventing Anna, Fortress was the hedge fund that I walked away from in 2015 to be a 36 year old PA at $10 an hour from a very close to six figure salary. <laughs> I, you know what, I think that we have a bad conditioning in this country to believe that real work means that we have to hate what we do in order for it to be real, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And I think we feel like if we're miserable, then we're doing the right thing. For some reason, it's just like, okay, you know, you gotta get up on Monday. Everybody lives for Friday, two weeks vacation and retirement and 401k. They may not and, necessarily be there. No, and like, we're not even in the place anymore where you at least work the 20 something years and get a gold watch. Like, yeah. you'll work years and then they'll act like you never, you were never there, you Absolutely. know? So, and even when I left corporate America, I was off and on because I had to eat. Mm -hmm. um, but I can proudly say I have not done anything outside of creative space since 2017, and I refuse to. I want to go back to the 90s for a second, because for a second, because I know for a fact that the 90s musically was treacherous, like it was crazy. How did you survive that part? of your Barely. life moving into the industry? Barely. Um, when I left the group, well, when the group kind of dissipated in late 90s, 
95, early 96. I was a senior in high school, getting ready to go to college. Um, and I didn't, I was in a six girl group that turned to a four girl group. I didn't know what it was to be in a, like be on my own. Like I didn't know what that meant. And, you know, I had little to no confidence, little to no self-esteem. And so I was like, well, I wasn't the pretty one in the group and I wasn't the best singing in the group. And so who's going to want me? Mm -hmm. Am I worth anything by myself? Right, right. And unfortunately, you know, some names that we all know made me continue to realize that or feel like I wasn't worth anything by myself. You right. know, um, I got more Me Too stories from that world than I would like to have. Right. Um, and then, you know, you get into a place where you're singing background for like a very well-known artist. I was never credited on the album. I never got paid. It was ugly. It was mm -hmm. ugly. And so that's why in the early 2000s, when I came back to New York, I wasn't thinking about making music really. I was like, I'm gonna figure out this acting thing. And I was like, and then I discovered musical theater and was like, oh wait, I can do the two of them together. Um, but I can't read music and I don't have perfect pitch. The reason why I stay on pitch now is because I got like, it was, I got yelled at enough that now my ear is sharp, but that's a long time. And when you're in a group right. with four, five other people, if you're not always directly on your note, you could kind of hide underneath somebody. <laughs> when it's <laughs> been, you ain't no hiding, honey. You flat, you flat. Right, right. And so, you know, it was a lot that I didn't anticipate. And so, you know, the 90s music scene was hard, but I don't want to woe is me it because there were a couple superstars out there that really loved me and looked out um, as that time passed. Like, you know... I worked with, you know, I was signed to Bowleg Lou in full force for a bit. They're to this day very good friends of mine. Um, you know, the deal didn't fly, but they tried and it was kind of around. I, I, I love Lou's energy. Yeah, and very like good and supportive. I'm of um when I was signed to Lou and Full Force, that was when they were working with Britney and in sync and Rihanna mm -hmm. and like brand new Ponder replay Rihanna, like right. and, those that was money and 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 cloud and like so I just didn't I didn't fit in that world at that time and they were trying but it just wasn't it wasn't meant to be and so mm -hmm. you know I loved those men for how they loved on me and and really gave me some confidence and then I started training with Ankara um, in about 2010 I still train with Ank when I can um, and he is one of my spiritual dads I love him to life. Um, and he really was one of the people that told me, helped me figure out who I was. Um, if you know Ankh at all, you know that he's clairvoyant. Um, and you know that he's not shy about telling you the future he sees for you in that moment. Right. <laughs> not always the funnest convo, but whatever. Um, and Ankh really helped me find a space where it was like, oh, but wait, I I am beautiful and, and I do have worth and value outside of just my labor. And, and I do have something to offer and something to say. Um, and so- well, You know what, the craziest thing to me um, that I find, or the most complicated thing that I find with women is that, you know, I think other people see your beauty before you see it in yourself. Well, because- And, I, it's, and it's, to me, it's so evident. You, but see, the... especially if you are a child of the late 70s, 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. especially if you are a brown, dark-skinned little girl who is not multi-ethnic on the outside, no matter what you have in your background. And so you know that in the 80s and 90s, what was coveted was light-skinned, curly-haired girls. Yeah. And as a West Indian that was a big thing. We were ruled by the British. And while there were very many people that were adamant about the beauty of blackness, there were just as many people that assimilated anything beautiful in the white space. Mm -hmm. So 
living and traveling back and forth, you know, as a child to the islands or whatever, I was a good 10 shades darker than this. So my own family members, blacky, darky, ugly, you know what I mean? And so, and then my mom and I didn't have the best relationship. So she was doing what she was doing. My father was estranged, estranged. And so all of those things just had me in a space where I saw no beauty in myself on the inside or the outside. Right. The only thing I had to cling to was whatever talent I could muster. Um, I, people compliment my fashion sense all the time and I laugh because it's birthed by such an ugly thing. Right. I would say, I always said, well, I'm pretty and don't nobody really want to bother with me. But at least if I'm dressed well, they'll say, well, she looks nice. Wow. That was what wow. got me Because I was like, well, nobody cares about this. But if I look, if my, if my ear is hot, it'll at least garner somebody caring about something about me. Right, right. We all have these childhood traumas, man, that, that, that we still carry with us. And it, they continue to be triggers. I think we have, it's a, a daily practice for us to work through. Mm -hmm. For sure. And it's like, I'm now at a place where, you know, my late 40s, I really, I mean, my late 30s into my early 40s, I really addressed my sexual trauma my familial trauma, my personal trauma, my relationship trauma, and a lot of that stuff. And I still get triggered. I still fight every day to see what other people seem to see. Um, I still work to not do things for the validation of others. Um, and it's a fight. Like, it's a, it's a daily fight. You know, growing up with parents that weren't really engaged, I always wanted somebody to see me. I get it. So for a long time in my life, I would go through all these antics just to be seen. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessary, but it was all I knew. So it's kind of like when people say, it all, you know, good, bad press, it's all press. So it's press, it's good press. Yeah. Like, even yeah. bad press, good press, it's not. It's not. And I'm, I'm very thankful for the therapists and the prayer support system that I have in my chosen family. And and now the relationship I have with my mom is unmatched. And, you know, my biological dad, I hadn't seen him in 31 years. And I saw him right when the pandemic started for the first time in 31 years. And now we talk every day. Um, so, like, the healing is in process. And, and, and so I think that the youthfulness and the glow that everybody keeps referencing in the last year or so is just me healing and having found some level of peace and learning how to set boundaries and learning how to let go of some things and understanding that, you know, my happiness starts here. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like it's, and this business is when you have no low to no self-esteem, self-worth, this business is not a safe space for you because oh, not at all. So several of the situations that I got into where I got assaulted or was dealt with in, in an unfavorable way, I put my, not to excuse my offenders, right, right. but I put myself in some of those situations because I was so in need of someone seeing me that I fell into the wrong places and with the wrong people. And instead of seeing a broken little girl or a broken young woman, they saw an opportunity. And unfortunately, some of them took that opportunity. And with that taking, they took parts of me. Um, but I'm thankful that at this point, um, it ain't happening no more. So I'm always, you know, now that I know a lot about show business, you know, I look back and I, you know, I used to always question myself, like, why couldn't I get into this at 10? Why couldn't I have started then? And I look back and I look at all of the stories that I've heard and all of the, everyone else's stories. I'm like, man, I'm so happy that I was able to live life because 
yeah, yeah. It, I always wondered how come my career never took off in the way that I wanted. Yeah. In my teens, in my twenties, in my thirties, child, I'd be somewhere either dead or cracked out. I did. <laughs> I did not. I, 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 I had a all. desperate need to be a part. I needed to be a part, and that need that that feeling of wanting to be a part of something will put you in situations and cause you to do certain things that that, that are not, very unhealthy. Well, or or just aren't who you are at your core. Truly, you know, I've done things and engaged in things that just are not identifiable of who I am. Mm -hmm. I have treated people horribly in certain instances, not because that was what they deserved, but because I was trying to prove a point or mm -hmm. be who I wasn't or impress somebody who don't even mean shit. Like, it's really wild when I think back on some of it, but thank God for grace. Um, thank God for grace. Thank God for restoration. Thank God for forgiving folks who see what you're not even putting out there sometimes, you know, and and then thank God for not holding on to all that was done to me to feel the need to do it to the next person. Amen. Amen. You know, that's what one of the reasons why I started this is because I didn't want to, it got to a point where I felt like I was in competition with people. And, and I don't want to be in competition with people. No, no. The the people who are doing beautiful things. I want to celebrate that. No. My was silent competition with mofos. And you thinking y'all, it's about y'all collectively. And that other person is like, oh, they got a head. Let me do. Child, baby, only it's me against me. Yeah. That's true. It's me against me. That's true. And the enemy. That's true. He the only person I got to fight with. And honestly, I don't even fight with him. Yeah. I I, I say my prayers. I try to be a good person. You let God, you let God handle that. Let God deal with that. that Absolutely. Form. I ain't got it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's true. And, and, and I want to be, you know, I, I feel like it's always important for us to be intentional about what we put out into the world. You know, so I, rather than be in competition with my colleagues and all the people that I feel like are doing beautiful things, why not celebrate them publicly? It's right. One to get, it's one thing to give you a DM. But it's another thing to come out and just tell tell me that like if I if I felt if I felt like Okima's a badass, I want to tell her that she's a badass. You know what but I'm saying? You are so you are so consistent with giving people their flowers, especially black women. Um, I put a post up today and I was like, it's a shame how many men love cat and hate women. Mm -hmm. And there's so many. They love some tail. Um, <laughs> I said what I said. Don't at me. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but you have consistently for pretty much as long as I've known you, and that was pre Instagram, Facebook. Like, yeah. we knew each other before social media. Yeah. Um, and you have always given black women specifically, I mean, everyone, but black women specifically, their flowers in one way or another. And that is who you genuinely are at your core. And that is beautiful because there's so many men that count it robbery to give an accolade to a black woman. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you, you know, you're definitely deserving of it. Of course you are. I'm curious to know that out of all the, because I believe that one of the beautiful things about being an artist is to be able to incorporate your experiences through life in your art, in your work. Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt, have you, or have, have you ever have taken the things that you've experienced in your life and infused it with your work? And how do you go about doing that? Um, I have, whether it's a character I play or something I write or how I work with other actors, if I'm directing or people, if I'm directing or whatever, um, I try to take my experiences and put it into my art. But I, several years ago, I made a discovery for myself. I don't want, and this is no shade. We all love Lady J. Blige. We love her. But I don't ever want to be in a space where the public is not happy with me unless I am unhappy. And 
I don't ever want to be in a place where my muscle memory is to lean on my tragedy. Right. I don't need to be down. I don't need to be the dark auteur. I don't need to be the sad artist to create. Yeah. It's much more pleasant for me and I feel like my work, those that I work with, for me to utilize my healing and my strength and my faith and my optimism to create. Because then it's not negating that my trauma has happened or my hurt has happened. It's not negate. Then when I utilize or dig from those dark places, there's so much sun that all I get is a shadow, mm -hmm. not a hole. And yep. so I use my experiences for sure in a plethora of ways, but I never want to predicate my ability to create effectively with my need to be in the dark. Yes, yes. It's operating in the place of a victor and not a victim. Because, child, let me tell you, the biggest hood is victimhood, and I refuse to be <laughs> Okay? I refuse to be Ain't no prize for the best victim. Right, let me, exactly. This, let me tell y'all, this industry don't give a fuck about you. Your hurt, your trauma, unless you are on top. And even then, it's only for as long as you are. I had to tell, yo, I had There's to tell this no brother that. Prize. Yes. Victim. Okay? Yes. Everybody loves Lady Viola today. When she was in them god awful wigs on Law Order, ain't nobody talk about her. But on that show, right? You know what right. I'm saying? Everybody, and she was killing it back then. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's like there, there's no prize for best victim. Mm -hmm. Miss Viola is in her what late fifties? Late fifties, yeah. And it took her, and she said it in an interview I saw it recently: thirty six years of the work to get to her magnum opus. Yep. I started at six years old. I am the most unfamous, famous person you'll ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, I'm one of, I won't say the, one of. Right, right, right. At 44, I'm just reaching my stride. Yeah. I'm just me reaching my stride at 44. And I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for every no. I'm grateful for every failed attempt at whatever. I'm grateful for all of it because now I'm in a space where I really, really, really appreciate the wins. Mm -hmm. But I've heard no and get out and you ain't it so many times. It don't bother me no more. Yeah. It doesn't affect me the way it used to. I don't take it personally when a festival doesn't accept my project. I don't take it. But that's not to say I don't then assess the why. Right. It's not because I wasn't enough. The right. wife, maybe I need to step up my production value. Maybe I need a, you know what I mean? Like, I, 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 did, the reason could be practical. Yeah. I dismantled the thing to find my space of improvement, right? Yes. Don't make it this quest to what was me about it. Yes. Because also, if I complain, who cares? No. <laughs> who cares? Nobody. Who cares but maybe my mama? And that is like, <laughs> my complaints are, is so fin infinitesimal. Right, 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 right. Who cares? Right. Nobody. And, 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 that's, and that's, nobody cares at all. No. You know, so you, you have to move in, in, in a way that you're doing it because it's something that makes your heart content. And that's the thing. But I realize that my ministry and my calling in this business. Yes, yes. I see it, that all the time. Yes. It is about the fact that I work in a lot of spaces that black and brown people do not often get to sit in. Mm -hmm. And I will either hold the door open or crack that joint and put a wedge at the bottom and be like, come on. <laughs> right. If they don't let me hold open the door, I'm going to crack the window and be like, Climb through. Right, right. I mean, and so I realized that my, like, I just directed a commercial for healthcare.gov this week, Monday and Tuesday. And fortunately, the agency that I work, and this commercial is specifically geared towards the Black community. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, the agency that I work with respects and loves me enough that they usually will ask me, outside of who they have internal, like, who do you want? Well, I also just 
produced a short for the award-winning enigma that is Haria Muhammad. Yeah. Short. We had some amazing people. Child Half That Crew was on my commercial. Right, 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 right. Because I counted not robbery to give you another opportunity. Yeah. Not to mention that we didn't have a whole score of money for our short. So for the people that do work for me for independent wages, I will push you on something to make a real wage if I can't give it to you. Right. Yeah. So like, right. I know my ministry or like working on working in very white space. When I was a producer on Beat Bobby Flay, I helped bring attention to maybe I wanted that's the food network for people who are wondering what you're talking about. Network. Um, I worked on Beat Bobby's Life right before the pandemic. Um, and it was my first time being a full fledged producer on, well, I was a segment producer. But if you work in food, you know that that means you did everything. I wrote the yeah. intro that Bobby would say, I wrote the fight bites, I wrote the bio packs, I wrote the intros for the judges, I helped hire the chefs, find the chefs. I got my seasons, we had no less than 10 black chefs. And of those 10, I want to say six of them were women. Wow. Several West Indian women, because you know. <laughs> um, and so that is my ministry. Yeah. That is my ministry. Or when I, my very first network job, 2017, Oprah's Masterclass, I was just the coordinator. And I had met I, I had met the director at NYWIFT. Um, shout out to New York Women in Film and Television. I sit on the board. Um, I met the director at this NYWIFT meeting. And they were like, the director of Oprah's Masterclass is coming. And I was in a very depressed state at that time. I couldn't find a gig. I had left corporate America. Swore I was never going to temp again. And I was like, what am I going to do? Because let me tell you something. Tuna and cereal only go so far. And right. so I had woke up one night in tears and I happened to see Oprah's episode of Oprah's Masterclass. And I had never seen the show before. I didn't even right. know, honestly. And the tears I shed. That was, and that that was, was crying. Powerful. Initially, I was crying because I was feeling sorry for myself. And then I yeah. watched her episode of her show and was like, I'm watching this Black woman on her network, on her show, tell her story. Baby. And then not even a month later... Nywift has the director for Oprah's Masterclass at Nywift. So I was like, I got to go. This is fine. I got to go. And so I'm ready to meet this sister. That's the director. I'm ready to go. And this little blonde haired blue eyed lady walked in. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> and I was like, the director. I was like, of what? They were like, Oprah's Masterclass. I was like, like Oprah Winfrey, Oprah? <laughs> <laughs> and this lady not. What? And, um, and so I <laughs> Because I was naive and didn't know, one, that networks don't make their own stuff. So for those that don't know, networks do not usually make their own work. They hire production companies who then hire all the people to make the thing 90% of the time. And so by the time this woman finished talking, I wouldn't care if she was pink with purple polka dots. I was like, I want to work with you. Right, 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 right. Because right. she had started as the line producer. Right. And became the director. Right. And out of it all. Right. And so I had already at this time approached several Black executive producers about opportunities coming in as whatever. Because I knew, though I had by that time produced my own short, produced the, you know, written, directed a bunch of short plays that had won awards. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any credits that mattered to them. Then was this Sundance? Then was this some South by South, like Berlin? None of that. Right, right. Cache was attached to my name, so they did not care about what I had not worked in their world. So I knew I was gonna have to carry records, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was fine. <laughs> um, I had approached a lot of black women, executive producers, some who are my friends and I think don't remember that I came to them and then they had nothing for me, but it's fine. Uh, and so uh. um <laughs> and so them paid me any mind or return my calls or emails or whatever and that could be for a bevy of reasons because people can now say that about me like i reached out to that bitch right 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 i tell anybody if you have reached out to me and i have not responded you got the key like I, it's not annoying to me i mean don't do it every day but like if yeah. i re if you reach out to me and i haven't responded in a week or two reach back out 
mother was probably underwater child. <laughs> Let me shout out Kia Williams. She's in the room. She's a uh, Hi, Kia. DGA, soon to be producer. Um, you know, but she likes to lay behind the radar. But but yeah. Hey girl, hey. I see. <laughs> Listen, girl, we out here to get all the letters. All of them. <laughs> you want the whole alphabet behind your. <laughs> I'm only too short. I'm waiting to get DGA and WGA. I'm right there behind you. Right. I got everything else. Yeah, um, I'm working on the WGA. But um, yeah, no, this, this white woman saw value in me and potential. And while it paid five cents, she offered me a job. And I started as the coordinator. And it just so happened that in my final seat, I worked on the final season of Oprah's Masterclass, which was season six. All of the masters were black. My boss, at the time I was 37, 37 or 38, my boss was 23, white, fresh out of college. She was the production manager. She also knew nothing about these people because she wasn't born when they were high. Um, and she was wonderful. She was, administratively, she was great. But baby, when she told me she bought Steve Harvey's book, think like a man, act like a woman, yeah, yeah. and was stashed and was like, I, there were no pictures of him in it. <laughs> well, ma'am, it's a novel, there wouldn't be. <laughs> well, when she said she it, old school pictures of LL, and I was like, oh, check right on in Blackbeat. They should be. She was like, I, what? And then I had to remember she was 23 and also white. And I was like, I got it. Oh, and yeah. so I did. You probably don't even know what Bob is. How Bob. So, but what I realized and recognized was this young lady was very good at her job. She just didn't know like these things, right? Mm -hmm. and people were like, well, how was she good at her job? She was because she, we all, our schedules were always together. People got their paperwork. Like she did what she needed to do, right? Right. right. Um, so what I learned in that process was find the holes, fill them, and don't make a big deal about it. Yeah. yeah. I never ever took an opportunity to make her look like she didn't know what she was doing. I never took any opportunity to make her look bad or less than. Mm -hmm. I just did my job. And so in third, I went from uh, office PA to coordinator. And she went and she got a promotion to produ from coordinator to production manager. I wasn't mad she got promoted because I got promoted. Now it's that five cents. It was 10 cents. Okay, let's go. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, still nothing. But I learned so much on that job. And that director... <laughs> To this day, was my sponsor for the PGA. Will write a recommendation for anything I ask her for because she is PGA, DGA, all the things. Yeah. Um, she will sit and talk with me. She will make time for me. Um, and the things that she says about me make me cry because all I was trying to do was survive in a world I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. And be good at something that was new to me. Yeah. And I, my mentor, Patrick Coker, if you're not you with Pat. He's the showrunner for Tales on BT and also a supervising producer for the new show coming out East New York. Yeah, um, that just premiered last week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Pat, I called Pat and I was like, I'm going to quit. This is terrible. He was like, so what you're not going to do is that you're going to shut up, stop complaining and stay on these white people's show and figure it out right. and make yourself useful. Right, right, right. And Pat talks me off the ledge every time. <laughs> every time Pat talks me off the ledge every time. And I did, and it was the best thing I'd ever done for my career because I didn't have any credits but Oprah's master class, but it was Oprah's master class. Yeah. So from there, I got onto Chopped, and I went to Chopped as a coordinator. Yeah. And it was a swing coordinator, so I even got to produce special episodes like the Drop. Right. Um, and, and, and it then snowballed. Chop, wait, you said Chopped was the Food Network, right? Chopped is the Food Network, too, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I was a coordinator for Chopped. Um, and then, you know, and then it just began to snowball. And so now, you know, I worked on Oprah's Mastercast in, class in 2017 as the office PA turned coordinator. Fast forward three years and in 2020, I was on the road as the field producer and second unit director for COVID doc. So making a day mm -hmm. what I was making a week. Right. Three right. years prior. Right. So like. You just gotta do the work. Yeah, and and and, and conversations I also had with black women in the industry. Uh, you really have to be strategic in how you move. 
I was just telling one of my, I don't call her a mentee, one of my young ladies that I love, um, we went out yesterday to Paley Fest to see Queen Sugar. Um, and I took her, I invited her, we went, we saw, she was so inspired and, and we had, I took her to dinner and I was like, you have to be strategic about what you, cause she, I wound up hiring her as my co-producer on Harita's project. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, now you have to be very careful what you work on. You can't work on this and then go work on something not so great. Yeah. Because then people gonna look at you like you were a one hit wonder. Right, right. And so once I started doing network work, I had to be really strategic about the independent stuff that I touched. And as sometimes I wasn't strategic enough because I had a, a, a script that went very much to me and I handed it over to someone else to produce because I was the lead in it. And I was like, okay, I'll co-direct it. And I hated it. And it wasn't very good. Yeah. Actually, it was bad. <laughs> and I tried to pretend it wasn't. Right, right. Because right. everything I touched had been hot. Like, it, right. baby, I pulled that joint right off the festival circuit. Like, y'all not going to embarrass me and I'm not going to embarrass these folks. Nope. And so it will never see the light of day, and it's fine. You gotta get you get to the point where you got so you get comfortable saying no. Can't honest and be like, babe, this ain't it. Mm -hmm. Because you've worked on it, so you know what that looks like, and mm -hmm. and it's okay. And I mean, I still am a little salty about it, but I also gave my autonomy away because I was still in a space of doubting myself, and had I. Oh my shit myself versus handing it to a man who just wanted a check or yeah. like that's the way it felt yeah i would not have had a product i wasn't happy with yeah I wasn't in control of any of it i gave all of my control away and it cost me more than the money more than the several thousand dollars about ten thousand dollars it cost me time and it cost me cachet yeah Thankfully, it didn't cost me the actors that I flew out to do the film. Right, right. Because they knew me, and they had great performances. I was able to right. get real pieces, and we were good. But, like, it cost me because I myself. And I was like, we're never going to do that again. I think it's, it's always funny to me where, like, I feel like a lot of people will underestimate who we are. And um, they just assume that, like, you know, um, we're accessible. So, oh, my mama gets on me about that all the time. She's like, Okima, you understand that you're now at a place where everybody can have access to you all the time, right? And yeah. I'm about. It's like, mommy, who the hell am I? Like, Well, we we had a conversation about that when you have, somebody you got have, fired. Somebody okay. fired me and then hired everybody that I knew. You hired, you hired my crew. Like, they not going to call me? Yo, it's a little slow. <laughs> you a little slow. <laughs> And, and that's because when people have accessible, when they have access to you or easy access to you, they don't they they don't understand how much you're worth. They don't understand the value that they're getting. But you have to understand. And the problem Absolutely. is, I wasn't getting enough value on myself because I knew so many narcissistic, arrogant mofo's in this game that did that right. Yeah. And I confused narcissism with self worth. And so I was like, well, if I sit and say that, I'm, then I just look, no, ma'am. Actually, what you do is you dole out your time in ways that make sense. Yes, absolutely. You delegate as you are able. Like, I'm, I'm getting ready to hire an assistant because I'm just, I, I don't have the capacity. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah, I, I'm sure. Well, S Corp now. And so I haven't updated my books in months, but I've been traveling and, doing work things and spending and all these other things forever. And like, so I'm I'm behind. Sometimes they know what you bring to the table. Don't want you to know. Child, yeah. Every time somebody wanted my rhythm and not my blues. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. No. Everybody just want to be hot. Out here. Everybody just want to be hot. No, but it's not. It's, it's bigger than want to be hot, Phil. I have been in several partnerships in this industry or entertainment as a whole, not just film, where they wanted me to suckle the baby and be the wet nurse. 
But the minute that little mofo called me mama, it was a problem. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. It's like I'm a little nervous. And it's like, but but you brought me here for what I have to offer. And now you're angry that people are hailing me for what I've given. Yeah. Isn't that what you brought me here for? And the thing about it is, I cannot control what people say or do. I've never dealt with anything outside of a we. Yeah. I've corrected folk and made it we. I got it's all the that they only say me because I'm the one who they see do the work. Yes. yes. <laughs> Truly. I got I got to get my five questions in before. before okay. We get. Go ahead. All right. So. My first, my first question is, what do you know about the industry now opposed to when you first entered? That people in this industry ain't shit, and there's so many wonderful people in this industry. It's both. It's a jumbo shrimp. Yo, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. it yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. No way around that one. <laughs> what advice would you give your 19-year-old self? Mm. bet on you nobody else is going to do it there is no calvary nobody is coming to save you save yourself by betting on you what do you want your legacy to be that i left it all on this planet when i leave here amen yes so what brings you joy? Good food. Good. Um, what do you say? I say? Good food. Good food. Um, what brings me joy? Good food. Um, great humans. Yeah. That choose to be humane. And... knowing that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. What are you grateful for? The ability to forgive and the ability to be forgiven. Yeah. And that necessarily doesn't always mean just having to take somebody and accept somebody's abuse. Oh, I'm going to allow you to continue to abuse me. It just means I'm going to forgive when you abuse me and not allow myself to be abused again. Yeah. Truly. Change behavior is the only thank you. I, is the only uh, apology I want. Yeah. And if that, then I will forgive you apology or not, but also over the What's wish, coming up for you? I wish you the best over there. Yeah. <laughs> What's coming up for me? Um, well, that healthcare commercial will be dropping next month before opening events, so I'm excited about that. Um, right now, I have a commercial I directed for Lifetime for the Hisp for Hispanic Heritage Month that's floating around, um, and I am presently uh, the casting and story producer for. Um, I don't know that I could say the name of the show, but season two of a show on Peacock. Nice. Um, it's a three-part docu-series. And are, are, are you are you the uh, sole casting director, or are you, in, are you under a department? Okay. It was just me and all 50 of these people I had to get through. Okay. Um, <laughs> but um, I am the sole casting director. I was the sole casting producer, and um, I am the sole story producer for uh, season two of this show, and we're going bigger and better for this and um, I have spent the last three weeks meeting and interviewing and learning more about 50 black and brown founders in tech, all kinds of tech. Yeah. Um, and never have I ever been so full and so proud of who we are as black and Latin folks. Um, and while, of course, I can't cast everyone, um, I think we're going to have a stellar cast. Yeah. Um, grateful for everybody that interviewed with us. <laughs> but with me and um and just god always knows what i need when i need it and to sit and watch these black and brown people talk about 
the millions of dollars that they have raised, how they have done it and why they have done it and what their products and inventions are, are going to do for this world and for right. humans. I am so, it gave me a lot more hope in humanity. <laughs> but you know what, it's so, but that's who we are. That's who we've always been. We've always been innovators. We've always been entrepreneurs. We've always been cutting edge because we had to. Right, right. There was no other choice for us. Right. What happens is that they begin to take what we've made out of nothing and mass market. Right, right. But that's why the thing I tell people, though, none of that feels fair or fun or mm -hmm. great. But it's just like when people talk about, oh, this person took my idea. Or, oh, this. If you are a true creative and your creativity truly comes from the creator. Yes. There's so much more left. Yes. You could take my stuff. I ain't here to tell. I mean, I wouldn't advise that now. I have a great attorney. But, <laughs> right, uh, right. but people out there pilfering and pillaging, you can do that. But, honey, I could give you every single ingredient I put in my lasagna, but be the same because I got the sauce. That's right. That's so true. You can take that and steal that IP and do whatever you feel you need to do with it. And it may even prosper. Right. right? But I'm going to leave y'all with one little story. If you know the word, and even if you don't, Saul was supposed to be David. Saul was supposed to be David. But Saul was impatient, and he was disobedient, and he thought he knew it all. And so, unfortunately, he did not become David. Now, God is awesome because grace is fun. You know, grace is, is fundamental with him. So Saul got to still be a king. He still had a kingdom. He still had riches. Still had his wife. Like, all things. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't no David. Right. And so what I'm telling you all is, in this game, do not Saul yourself. Be the David you're supposed to be. Right. Don't be messy and foolish and, and ugly because you might end up like Saul where you still have some things and you still live a decent life but you could end up like the people that didn't even make it to Saul's space right 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 live your best David life honey that's right that's right Just I agree I agree I agree. Thank you so much, my sister, for joining me tonight. I appreciate me. I appreciate your words. I thank you so much for all that you continue to bring to this industry. And like I said, as your star begins to continue to rise, that um, so is your list of credits. I can't wait to see what's coming next. <laughs> and I, I just wanted, I got it. I can't even close out without saying. Happy 100th birthday to the ladies of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. 100 years. Welcome to the Centennial Club. I know. Um, I like we so, never because, act like we're not 100. And I'm like, well, we're 100 now, so act right. <laughs> Stop trying to play it. You know what I mean? So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Success, success, success. And um, COVID is over, so my thing is, we down. I'm down to link up as long as you know. I know, I know. We got to figure it out. We got to get together. But like for everybody, for whoever is watching this now live or will watch this later, like, yo, you got it. Yeah. But just having it is not enough. Hone it, improve it. All the things, you know, just get what you can but make be the best version of the thing that you can mm -hmm. be the best version of whatever you say you are and that means that if there is an innate talent there please know that while innate talent is great technique on top of talent makes you unstoppable workshops guys, classes um you know get in small groups with your peers and 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 critique one another keep growing the learning never stops we and that's the stop learning people 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 forget that like keep growing improve yourself craft <clears throat> craft you do not want to go under the knife of some doctor that hasn't gone to 
the education. True. Yeah. So why do you make your audiences look at things that stalled where you stopped learning? Mm -hmm. Keep learning. Craft. And I, 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 I want to say this too to be clear. I still feel weird saying that because I'm still learning so much about yeah. the space. Keep learning and growing. Like, if you're going to be something, be the best version of that shit you can be. Yeah. Be a David. Thank you. Be a David. Yes, Ms. Lauren. Thank you. Yes, be a, be a David. And understand, like, you know, don't come into this industry just trying to be a star. If you just, just here to, to be famous. Find else. If you just here to be rich, find something else. If right. you just famous, find something else. Right. right. <laughs> be here because you love what you do want to give a contribution to the industry and the work and be exactly. here because you want to push the culture forward or everything ain't even got to be that deep. Be here because you want to make good stuff to keep people entertained and distracted when life is lifing. Yeah. It ain't got to be a bunch of culture shifts for everything. Yeah. I just want to watch some mindless shit and feel better. That's right. That's right. It don't have to be deep, but it needs to be good. Yeah. But it's subjective. But we all know what bad look like. Uh. <laughs> mm. and, you, and there's some bad there's a lot of bad stuff out there and you don't want to be in that club you don't want to be in the club that, 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 that people think is hot and you can't tell them that it's not right you know but like, I mean? do you want to be the best of the worst like who wants to yes. be that yes. who wants to be Saul ain't nobody out here trying to be Saul on purpose yes you know and, and, and be open it, you know what's interesting? I don't think people fully really is like realize that a critique is not saying that it's bad. A critique well, is not an insult. Some of y'all out here make really great stuff, but your critiques be ugly and mean spirited, and that's why yeah. people think that they don't want to get critiques because y'all out here hurting feelings. Yes. Mind no. delivery. If you have a critique for someone because you are at an elevated level in your space, make sure your delivery is humane. Because the intention is so, the intention is supposed to make it better. Make, yeah. make, and, if, and here's the thing: correction without solution is annoying. <laughs> if you want to correct me, it come is. with a solution, people. It is. It is. Because now is. you can feel like a hater. Yes, Why right. You don't want that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Mind your yeah. delivery. No, because somebody like me, if I critique, nice. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and work with you. But and here's yeah, the thing. Everybody's I, not like that. Yeah, I don't. I probably don't. I'll be honest. I probably ain't got time to work with you. But if you <laughs> ask for my feedback, I'm going to give it to you. But I'm also going to point you in the directions of the yeah. things that make it better. Yeah. Right? But, like, ain't no reason to be out here mean-spirited and ugly and nasty to people and making people's feelings hurt. Because I don't care what nobody says. There's plenty of tears in entertainment. Okay. I've cried my share and will have many more to cry. I have rivers left to cry. But be nice. Or if you can't be nice, don't say nothing. Nothing. If it's that bad, <laughs> like, baby, ain't no saving that. Like, right, then don't. Right, right, right. But if you out here making mediocre shit, don't ask for feedback. You say, say oh, nothing you see when you, when you see a baby that you don't think is the cutest baby in the world. I say, Just be like, oh, hey. look at you. I, right. I'd be like, look at him. <laughs> I so with don't you. make me <laughs> like it's a it's, it's a balance, folks. It's right, balance. right, 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 right. Thank you, my sister. I appreciate you coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Blessings <laughs> upon blessings to you. We'll chat soon. Yes, sir. I love you. If you need, I right, love you too. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye, guys. Shut up, Mari. <laughs>